Yes, you're good to go. All right, great. Um, then we'll go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you who don't know me already, I'm Sarah Glakas. Um, I'm the founder of the Austin Women's Investing Group. Uh, we are a dynamic and diverse group of women who enjoy learning and sharing investing ideas in a fun and comfortable environment. Uh, so back in 2011, my friend Michelle and I um, ended up getting together for coffee, talking about some investing topics. And Michelle looked at me after you know, a three hour conversation and said, you know, I think that this is something that other women would want to be a part of. I was like, well, maybe, maybe you're right. And so she went to Meetup, which was kind of a new website at that time, and signed us up for the Austin Women's Investing Group. And so that was 11 years ago. Um, since then, we turned from, you know, two people in the Austin Women's Investing Group to over 2,700, which is amazing. Um, our 11-year anniversary will be in March. We have over 1,000 women on our private Facebook group. Um, and we have a YouTube channel where you can go back and see all of the meetings that we've recorded really since March of 2020 when we started doing that. Um, so I think for us, one of the benefits of the pandemic is that we've been able to record uh, meetings and have them available for people who want to go back and refresh or who want to uh, attend the meetings, but maybe on their own schedule. Um, and the other benefit has been like, we're not the Austin Women's Investing Group anymore. We're really like the entire US Women's Investing Group and the global uh, Women's Investing Group because we're able to now have people from out of state or even out of the country join us at our meetings. And that has been so cool and such a blessing to be able to have that out there in the world. So for those of you in Austin, welcome. For those of you not in Austin, welcome. Everybody is welcome. And so I'm so happy that uh, everybody is here. Um, so again, I'm Sarah. I'm an investor, advisor, and founder of not only the Austin Women's Investing Group, but a registered investment advisory firm called Blackburn Financial. Um, last year, fellow a WIG member, Caitlin Meredith, and I also started a podcast called Women on the Verge of a Financial Breakthrough, um, which piggybacks off of a lot of the conversations that we have here in meetings. So that has been super fun. Um, check it out if you're a podcast person. Um, one of the things I always want to start with, especially at kind of this kickoff meeting, is that this group benefits from all levels of experience. Uh, if you were ever fortunate enough to attend one of our meetings in person, um, and really what we're trying to replicate here virtually is this idea of women learning from each other, right? So we need beginners to come to the group and ask questions. This is the space to do that. Ask whatever question pops up. You know, here while we're meeting virtually, drop your questions into the chat box. But we also need women who have answers to those questions. So at this meeting, I'll be kind of leading us through this topic of the stock market, you know, using my it, my own frame of reference. But there are lots of times that someone will drop a question into the chat box and someone else in the group will have a comment or a follow up or an answer. Those little side conversations are invaluable for people. Uh, so I highly encourage you to do that. If you have a question, ask it. This is the space to ask it. There are no dumb questions. They are all good questions. And if you have the question, someone else is gonna have it too. So please, please, please um, drop those questions in and do not be afraid to drop any question in that you can. We'll try to get to as many of the beginner questions as we can. I'll also do my very best to uh, try to go to more advanced topics. I will say that for this meeting, I have a lot that I wanna cover and it's a pretty big topic. We could keep it as focused on the stock market as possible, that would be ideal. Um, but if you have other questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and we will see if we have time to get to them. Um, okay, so uh, Gwen and Lori and Caitlin will be moderating the chat box. So they're gonna kind of be looking at all the questions that are coming in and then they'll stop me periodically to ask the questions and to have the conversation around what goes into the chat box. Um, okay, last thing. Okay, before I start, um, I just want to be very, very clear um, that nothing in this group is intended to be individualized investing advice. There's no investing advice. There's no legal advice. There's no tax advice. There's just no advice, period. Uh, we are all here to share our experience and our opinions. Um, even though I do this professionally during the day um, as a financial advisor, I'm here as uh, someone who's 
uh, hope, hoping to educate people and lead with education, I will certainly share my opinion, but nothing in this group is intended to be individualized investing advice. If you need investing advice, uh, call a financial advisor, uh, call a tax expert if you need tax advice, um, but still at the same time, please feel free to share your opinions and your knowledge and your experience with the other people here in the group. All right, did I miss anything? Caitlin, Merit, or Caitlin, uh, Gwen, Lori, did I miss anything or are we kind of good to go? I think you're good, yeah. I like the part about there's no dumb questions because we always know that's my specialty. <laughs> I'll shut up now. You have a kindred spirit on the call if you think that your question is dumb. Awesome. Okay. Well, it looks like we have 37 people on the, on the um, meeting so far. And so hopefully we'll have a chance to see some more people joining the group here in a little bit. So thank you all for being here. All right. Uh, well, let's get started. Okay, we're gonna do investing in stocks. This is the 2022 version. As we go through these like uh, disclosure slides, I'm not gonna go through each one. Please read them. Um, one of the main bullets in here though is the idea of past performance is not indicative of future results. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on that one. Uh, past performance is not indicative of future results means that even though we look at the past to try to find clues and try to find guidance as to what we need to do in the future, past, or past events don't enable us to predict the future. Um, what I love about the stock market and what I love about investing in general is that it's forward looking, right? So we have all of this information that happened in the past, but when you're investing, the past doesn't matter as much as you might think it does. It actually hardly matters at all. The only thing that matters is what's gonna happen in the future because we're trying to take this money that we've saved and buy an asset that we think will increase in value over time. And so to do that, we're trying to take all of this information from things that are happened in the past or things that are happening right now. And we're using that information to try to make the best decision we can going forward. Um, but, you know, like I'm sure that everyone on this call knows there's no crystal ball. There's no way to know what's going to happen. There's certainly no way to know what's gonna happen in the short term, but as we look to the past and look at what's happening right now, maybe we can get an idea as to what types of risks we're willing to take in the future, what types of risks we're not willing to take, what our timeline is, what our goals are, and what type of growth we can expect from different investing decisions that we make over time. Um, so uh, we'll kind of go ahead to the first slide. This is just like an introductory slide. I already talked about that. Um, so let's just start in with stocks. Um, for some of you who've been in the group for a long time, some of these slides will be familiar, especially at the beginning. But as we go through, um, we kind of move to the present day in some of the latter slides. So for those of you who have been to this, this meeting a couple of years in a row, you're going to see some stuff that you've seen in the past. So just hang in there with me and um, we will kind of move into uh, 2022 in a few slides. But I always like starting at the beginning because this is the beginning of a new year. We have lots of people who have never joined us before. We have lots of people who uh, maybe are uncomfortable in the stock market. So I like to start with kind of uh, some basic building blocks at the beginning. Here's a quote from Uncle Warren, Warren Buffett, who is one of the wealthiest people in the world, and he made his money through investing mostly in stocks and ownership in companies. Um, so Warren Buffett is a huge proponent of owning stocks for the long run. Uh, sometimes people ask what the long run is. Um, for me, I think 10 plus years qualifies as the long run. Um, but certainly we're talking about investing over decades, and you'll see why in a little bit. But um, my favorite Warren Buffett quote is, someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. So whenever we start thinking about the stock market, just know that in the stock market, time is essential. And so we'll see a little bit more about that um, in the coming slides. We can go to the next slide, Gwen. Before we get there, let's talk about kind of some four very, very, very basic principles of the stock market. One. Stock is ownership of a company. So ownership is different from lending. 
If you think about lending money to someone, um, either making a loan to someone or buying bonds, um, you're lending a company or a country person money. And those people sign a contract and they have to pay you back plus interest. If they don't pay you back, then they go through bankruptcy court. There's a whole big fight about it, but it's a contractual obligation. Stocks and ownership is not the same. If you have ever been a small business owner, if you have ever uh, worked a side gig, uh, if you've ever worked for a small business or really if you've worked for any business, um, there is no guarantee that the business is going to bring in enough money to pay all of its people and all of its expenses and have money left over at the end of the day. It's actually a pretty risky venture. Um, so that ownership piece is what is vital to know about the stock market. Um, it's the riskiest part of investing because you don't get any guarantees. You don't get any contracts. Um, you should have no assumptions about um, being protected uh, as an owner when things go bad in the company that you're invested in. So we'll talk a little bit about more, more about that going forward. The price of a stock, right? So prices move all the time. The price of a stock is simply where a buyer and a seller agree to make a transaction, right? So this is what all prices are. If we wanna kind of make um, an, an analogy to the real estate market, think about, um, you know, you are selling your house. You can list the house and have the listing price any price you want, right? Whatever you think is a good price, you list it. But the price of your house is where a buyer comes in and says, yes, I will pay you this amount for it. The two sides agree that is the price of the house. So in the stock market, this is happening all day, every day as the stock market is open. Um, the stock market opens at 8.30 central, it closes at 3 p.m. central. And during the day, all of these buyers and all of these sellers from around the globe are coming together during those trading hours and saying, I would like to sell the stock for this price. And buyers are coming in and saying, I would like to buy it for this price. And that supply and demand is what is moving the price from nanosecond to nanosecond. No one else, there's no third party setting the price. It's just the buyers and sellers. So imagine if you have a lot of sellers at one time, the price moves down, down, down until you have a buyer willing to step in. Same thing, if you have a bunch of buyers coming in, the price goes up, up, up until you have some sellers who are willing to let go of some of their shares in exchange for cash. So that is the dynamic of the stock market. And it happens instantaneously and you're constantly being fed this information. It's just, it's, it's happening. And for most people, it feels like a fire hose, right? Like just getting all of this pricing information second after second after second in the stock market. For some people that's cool and for some people it's overwhelming. Um, stock prices are always changing because investors' expectations about the future are always changing. So we have like at any moment, you have new information coming in, you as the investor and all of the other investors who are also getting new information at all times are trying to synthesize that in order to make decisions about what, what they do. Do they buy stocks? Do they sell stocks? Do they hold stocks? And so again, like that instantaneous synthesis of information, it leads to the dramatic swings in price. Uh, and that is also why, kind of leading to the fourth bullet point, for most investors, the stock market is only appropriate for long-term money. In the short term, all of these dynamics are working against you. The stock market is chaotic, it's volatile, that is what it's known for. It will never change, ever, ever, ever. It will always be that way. And so if you're stuck in a short-term mindset, for almost everyone, it's, it's not gonna work to your favor. There's too much volatility, there's too many unknowns. But over the long run, what we are expecting is that because of that day-to-day -day volatility, if you can hang through there during the ups and downs, you should be compensated with higher rates of return over long periods of time. And so I have charts on that if you are curious about that. Are there any questions so far before I go into the time value of money? 
part of the slides? Anything so far? All right, I'm just gonna keep going. Okay, so I almost, if you've ever seen me do anything like this before, you've probably seen me go through this example and I'm just gonna go through it again because it's my favorite concept in finance and I just can't stop myself. So what we're going to do is talk about the concept of time value of money. This is the financial equation that describes the phenomenon of compounding, right? Your money making more money over time. So if you looked at these formulas, like in a, a Finance 101 textbook, you would see that there's an exponent in those formulas. So what, we, what that means is that over time, investments have exponential growth. And so we'll see how that, how that works in an example in order to create wealth over time. So up here, let's assume that we have $10,000. Someone cut you a check for $10,000, you have $10,000 to invest. You're trying to figure out what you're gonna do with it. So our present value, oh, let me go back. In time value of money, the reason I like going through this and I use this all the time at Black Barn and all the time in Austin's investing group, and we talk about it all the time, there's really only five inputs. There's present value, what something is worth today, rate of return, which is how fast do you expect an investment to grow, payment, um, so that's if you are putting money into a retirement account, it's a positive number. If you're drawing money out of a retirement account, like when you are retired, it's a negative number, but it describes money going in and out. Number of periods, which when we're talking about like financial planning, that's usually number of years, and then future value. The idea is you come up with assumptions or actual numbers for four of those inputs, and then you solve for the fifth one. So you can use a financial calculator, you can use Excel, um, you could handwrite out the formulas, but no one does that. Um, you could use, you could Google uh, time value of money calculator, Schwab has a good one. But we can use these to plan out what we think will happen in the future based on certain assumptions. All right, so in the upper left-hand corner, we have $10,000 that we're investing. We are looking at an investment that we think and expect we'll get a 5% rate of return every year on average. Um, in this case, we're not gonna worry about payment. So this is just a $10,000 investment. We're not going to put any money in, but we're not going to take any money out. And we're going to invest this money for 10 years. So when we plug that into our financial calculator, we come up with $16,289. So that's good, right? That's six, six, that, or that $16,289. That $6,289 is growth on top of the original $10,000. This is what we're trying to do, right? Like we invested the money, we end up with more money. That's, that's what we're trying to do. Upper right-hand corner, we have the same assumptions, our $10,000, same investment, our 5% annual rate of return, Again, not putting any money in, not taking any money out of this account. But now we're gonna let it sit for 30 years. So we're giving it more time to season and to hopefully grow. So when we plug that in, we come up with $43,219, right? So that's a lot more than 16,000, but we had to wait a lot longer, right? So that should make sense. If we go down to the bottom left-hand corner, we have our $10,000 again we have our 10% rate of return. Um, sorry, let me back up. In this one, the 10 per, we, we're making a different investing choice. So instead of something that we think is going to get a 5% rate of return, now we're changing our strategy a little bit and we're investing that $10,000 in something we think will get a 10% rate of return over time on average. Again, we're not putting any money into the account, we're not taking any money out, and now we're gonna let it grow for 10 years. So when we plug that in, we get $25,937. Okay, so if we look at the example above, that should make sense. We invested in something that got a higher rate of return, so we ended up with more money, almost $26,000 instead of $16,000. So that's good. So now let's go to the bottom right-hand corner. We have our $10,000 investment. We have our 10% rate of return. We're not gonna put any money into this account and we're not gonna put any money out or take any money out, but now we're gonna let it sit for 30 years. You can kind of imagine this like a, like a retirement account. You put some money in and then you work, work, work and you come back in 30 years. 
when you come back in 30 years, that account should be worth $174,494. So this is super important, right? This is the secret sauce of investing. This is the formula that wealthy people and wealthy families know that over long periods of time, investing in something that is expected to get relatively high rates of return leads to more money than most people are able to calculate in their heads. Right. If we look at the example above it, it's still 30 years, but at a 5% rate of return, your mon money only grew into $43,000. At a 10% rate of return, your future value, value is not doubled. It's not twice as much. It's almost $175,000, with most of that growth happening in years 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, when you are really generating, I don't know, for a lot of people, life-changing amounts of wealth. So there's two components here, right? There's the time. How long are you doing this? And there's the rate of return element. What investments are you choosing? And what are your expectations when choosing them? Most people can't afford to be in a low risk, low return asset class for their entire careers or the entire pre-retirement part of their lives. Because when you get to the time when you need a nest egg, you're going to need that nest egg to be large enough to sustain you, hopefully, for many decades. Retirement is long. If you retire at age 65 and expect to live to age 95, that's 30 years, right? That's a really, really long time. You're going to need a lot of money. Right. So the trade offs that we make, the expectations that we set and being able to do the math to see the real world impact of choosing a 5 percent rate of return over 30 years versus a 10 percent rate of return over 30 years is really important because then you get to choose. Right. I have a lot of people. I meet so many people who say. I'm a conservative investor. I don't want to take a lot of risk. Um, so, you know, I'm okay in bond funds, in cash, you know, in things that are relatively safe. I don't want to be in the stock market. It feels like gambling. It's way too risky for me. That is totally cool, but you need to run the numbers to know how much more money you need to save. The worst combination is being a conservative investor who's not able to save very much because when you get to retirement age, you might not have enough. There's a very, very real risk that that will happen. Uh, if you are only able to save a little bit of money, it might be the case that you need to take more risk, maybe more risk than you would otherwise choose. But if you're doing it because these numbers speak to you and you know that you're going to need to end up with more money in order to uh, be financially secure during your retirement years, then at least you can make that decision mindfully not just kind of settling into a conservative investing uh, strategy without knowing what the dollar impact is. Um, I have more numbers. Um, oh, yeah, here they are. On um, people who often the next question is, well, how do we get that 10% rate of return, right? Or what's the expected rate of return for different asset classes over time? Um, so this is a chart that you've seen in the past. It's only still updated through the end of 2020. Um, hopefully soon we get the one from 2021. So what we're looking at on the y-axis is the one up and down, right, math people, um, is our compound annual rate of return. So this is the R from those time value of money uh, slides that we just looked at. Um, on the x-axis, going across the bottom, we have something called standard deviation of annual returns. So in investing, this is most often the number we use as a measure of risk. It's a measure of volatility. Um, so as you are on the kind of the left-hand side of the scale, those are lower risk, lower volatility asset classes. And as you move to the right, the prices of those asset classes is moving in a more extreme way. Um, so if we look at the asset classes down in the bottom left-hand corner, hold on, let me make my screen a little bit bigger so I can actually see. 
my own slide. Okay, so here at the bottom left-hand corner, we have a little gold diamond that says cash. And we have a little gold diamond that says aggregate U.S. bonds. So these are low risk, low return asset classes. Um, I you know, note that this is data going back to 1995. I know that there aren't maybe any of you out there who are actually getting 2% on your cash savings these days. Um, it includes data from the past. Um, but the relationship is still there, low risk, low return. If you take a little bit more risk and you lend some companies some money and they pay you interest in return, you're taking on a little bit of risk that they might not pay you back. And in exchange, you get or you have gotten a higher rate of return. But still, you're not really taking that much risk. Bonds aren't really that volatile. They're pretty stable as an asset class. Now, if we go to the right, to the upper right hand corner, this is where our risky asset classes are clustered. So the upper left diamond in the triangle is large US stocks. So that's in this example, it's the S&P 500. And I don't have the source data here in the footnote of uh, this slide. If you want it, just email me and we'll send it to you. S&P 500. We have small US stocks. So smaller companies, um, as uh, and the index for smaller companies is the Russell 2000. And then over there in the upper right-hand corner, we have real estate. So on this slide, all of you people in Austin or wherever you are, this real estate is commercial real estate. And so it's an index made up of real estate investment trusts. So think um, office buildings, um, other commercial buildings, malls, apartments, things like that. Um, not the home that you live in, right? That's a whole other asset class or part of an asset class that is not included on this slide. Um, and we talk a lot about real estate investing in the group. So um, if you wanna know more about that, you can check out those videos. But this is commercial real estate. So in these asset classes, the, maybe the one thing that everybody knows about the stock market is that it goes up and down a lot. That's what this is telling us. It's telling us what we already know. The stock market goes up and down a lot. Commercial real estate as an investment is also very volatile, very boom and busty. And so those asset classes over this period of time from 1995 to 2000 were very volatile and they had relatively high rates of return relative to all of the other asset classes on this chart. So you can see here that large U.S. stocks, small U.S. stocks, commercial real estate, they all have annual rates of return north of 8% and getting pretty close there to 10% on average over those 25 years. So you did not get high rates of return without taking risk. On the contrary, you had to go through lots of ups and downs, lots of bubbles, lots of crashes in order to get that higher rate of return over time. If we look down here at non-US stocks, you can see, so this is com companies that are based outside of the US for US investors. You can see that those were also very volatile, but they didn't compensate a US investor with a higher rate of return. And then commodities down here, this little bottom gold uh, diamond, oh, super rough, right? So commodities are raw materials that get used up to make other things. So in Texas, you think oil and gas, right? But it's also things like timber, um, soybeans, uh, anything that you use to make something else. Commodities over, you know, since 1995 have been incredibly volatile and have a negative annual return over that time period. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Maybe these relationships change going forward. But I always like looking at this chart and pointing that part out because often people will say to me, well, if I take risk, then I'll get a higher return. And it's, that's not an if then statement. It's if you take risk, maybe you should expect a higher rate of return. But looking at these numbers, that's not a guarantee, right? So we're always talking about expectations and what we think will happen based on the past. and But keeping an eye out for opportunities where maybe these trends change, um, who knows? This is a, like a many decades of information. So I would kind of take it at face value for what it is and say, okay, 
I've been thinking as a U.S. investor, I probably concentrate on the asset classes in the upper right-hand corner um, if I'm looking for if I'm looking to be compensated for the risk that I'm taking. I'm going to stop. Can we go back there and see if there are any questions on that? I'm assuming there are. Um, there is one from Rhiannon, and actually I'm curious too. Why do you think that um, non-U.S. stocks have so much lower return than U.S. stocks? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's because those economies uh, haven't grown as fast as the U.S. over that period of time. So these non-U.S. stocks are developed markets. So the index is IFA, um, Europe. Uh, Far East and Australia, uh, in Europe and Japan specifically, uh, their economies have not grown very much. Japan, especially since kind of like the middle, what is like the mid 80s or the mid 90s, uh, Japan's economy hasn't, it's kind of gone sideways. Um, there are probably a handful of reasons for that. And one of the most serious is demographics. Um, those are countries where population is going down. Um, in the U.S., our population is still increasing, mostly because we are open to immigration and um, are able to increase our population steadily over time through immigration, where Europe and Japan haven't been able or willing to do that. So that's probably why this relationship exists. Um, and so, you know, that is like, we're not going to talk too much about demographics here, but if you think about the way the economy grows, uh, the, the one of the calculations you do is the change in population plus the change in productivity should lead to increasing or decreasing uh, GDP, gross domestic product, or pr gross domestic product. So if you don't have a very high change in population or if you have a decreasing population, it's almost certainly going to be a drag on your economy unless you develop really, really tricked out awesome ways for each person to be more productive. And that just hasn't really happened over this time period. And I don't know if it's expected going forward either. That would be something interesting to look at. It was a really good question. Sarah, there was another question about how um, inflation plays into all of this, especially when you're looking at a 10 or a 30 year horizon. Yeah, that is an awesome question. We're gonna talk about inflation so much, you guys. Um, but in this chart, these rates of return are nominal rates of return. So that just means it's it's the rate of return that gets spit out from the time value of money calculations uh, when you do them. Uh, but inflation is happening at the same time. So if you take the nominal rate of return and subtract the inflation rate, you end up with something called your real rate of return. So I think think last time I looked at it, the inflation rate over this period of time was something like an average of 3%, with much of that higher rate of inflation being in the years leading up to 2008, and then a very low rate of inflation since then. 3% um, might be a little bit high over this time period. Um, so if you take, uh, if you say, okay, maybe stocks returned um, eight and a half percent, and over that period of time, inflation was averaging two and a half percent, then, I'm using my calculator for this, by the way, eight and a half minus two and a half would mean that stocks grew by six percent real, real rate of return. So when we're investing, that's an excellent question. And we're going to talk about it so much, you guys. You're going to, I hope you like it. I don't know. Uh, the only thing that matters when we're investing is how much we really make, right, or really lose. And that is definitely related to, well, how much is the price of stuff going up? So the inflation piece is an important part of that component. Um, so we will talk about real rates of return and expectations on that going forward. But um, these numbers are nominal. So you take the nominal rate of return, subtract the rate of inflation over that period of time, and then you get the real rate of return. What it also means for inflationary periods, and this is gonna be something that we come back to and talk about in future slides. If the rate of um, inflation over this period of time was two and a half percent, and you got 2% on your cash, that's a negative 0.8%. So 
0.5% rate of return, right? If you played it pretty safe and you were in the bond market, you had a 5% rate of return nominal and inflation was running at 2.5%, your real rate of return was 2.5. Bonds and cash tend to be very bad performers during times of inflation and very good performers during times of disinflation or deflation. Stocks tend to be good performers during times of inflation because those companies, remember like it's ownership and companies, those companies have a lot of flexibility as to how they adjust for inflation. And so because it's a more adaptable, flexible type of arrangement, stocks have been able to course correct and adjust to still return, in this case, probably like six-ish percent on top of inflation. So you're still growing your wealth by 6% on top of inflation. Does that make sense? That's a really good question. All right, I'm gonna keep going, but we can definitely come back to this chart. All right, before we go further, I'm gonna kind of take it back to kind of the basics of um, stocks um, and just show you really quickly an income statement, highly stylized income statement. So every quarter, a publicly traded company has to publish its financial statements. And then it, it gives you a bunch of, in, the company gives you a bunch of information on their earnings call. The information that most stock investors are looking at is something called the income statement. So at the top of the income statement, oh, it's also called like the PNL or the profit and loss statement or the statement of income, or something like there's lots of different terms for it. At the top of the income statement, you have this category called revenue. It's also called sometimes sales or called the top line because it's at the top of the income statement. So this is where a company takes, uh, you go to the Apple store, you buy your iPhone, you give Apple $1,000, they give you your iPhone, and they put that $1,000 in the revenue category, right? It's how much money they collected from you for goods and services. So it's a very important number. The next major line item is costs of goods sold. So how much did it cost Apple to make this iPhone, right? So there's raw materials, there, there's all sorts of stuff that goes into an iPhone. That's all accounted for on the income statement and cost of goods sold. The next thing, oh, and Apple has to pay its suppliers, right, for supplying its, uh, its raw materials. The next broad category is operating expenses. So these are the expenses that Apple has to pay in order to keep the lights on at the company, right? So you need people, uh, which is payroll. You need all sorts of computers and equipment. Uh, you need office space for all those people. You need benefits. You need all sorts of stuff to run a company. So that gets put into this broad category of operating expenses. Um, if a company has borrowed any money, then on the income statement, there's a category for interest. So how much interest did it pay to its lenders? And then if there's any money left over, there's a category for taxes or how much the company owes the government. And then after all of those other people have gotten paid, at the very bottom, there's something called earnings, right? So earnings are known by many, many names. Um, people also call them profits or net profits or net earnings or net income. And then sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the bottom line because it's at the bottom of the income statement. This earnings piece, is what is the most interesting number and the most important number to stock investors. Because this is where you get, there's money left over if you're an owner. So if you're investing in a company, you want earnings to be as high as they could possibly be because that's kind of your money, right? It doesn't mean you take all of the earnings out and spend it or it gets distributed to you. It just means like, hey, my company makes more money than it spends. And that is going to make my company more valuable. Or my company doesn't make any money now, but it will eventually. And I'm able to show investors the path towards that. Um, or like, oh my gosh, this company is not making any money. This is going really askew. Maybe we need to get out. So this earnings number is super important. On Friday, we really started 
earnings season in earnest on Friday. Um, some big banks reported earnings. So right now we're right in the very, very beginning of earnings season when all of these companies that are publicly traded release this information to investors. So this is kind of an exciting time to be in the stock market because we're all getting this really, really important information here kind of starting in the first part of the quarter and um, going through. So if you have companies that you're interested in owning individually, uh, find out when they announce earnings and jump on their earnings call or um, set an alert so that you get the information when it's put out there. It's really, it's really, really interesting. Not only do they tell you what they earned in the past, but most of the time, the, the CEO and the CFO and everybody will be on the call. They will give you guidance as to what they think is going to happen in the future, which is actually the most important information they can give you. Um, so this is why earnings season is so important. Um, and this is how you get some of that information that you need to decide, um, you know, if the companies that you might be interested in investing in um, are doing well, are they on the right track or something else. All right, so we're going to take that earnings piece and now we're going to put it on a chart, my favorite chart. Again, Sarah, I know some can of I you interrupt oh. you for one question? Yeah. Sorry. Of course. Asking for me. I just want to put on record that as someone who wants to be invested in the stock market for as long as I'm alive from now on, ever since I met you, I never, ever want to look at one of those statements <laughs> and I don't have to, right? So like, I'm so glad you're explaining it. That's amazing. I can decode it. And also that's the only time I'm going to look at one of those, but I can still be an investor and make money in the stock market, correct? Sure. You can just, okay. you can just. You can just hit the snooze button. You can just take a little nap. You know, maybe for the rest of the call. Every word you say, I just will never, ever look at a company's report. And I just want it on record that I can still be an investor and benefit yes. from the stock market without doing that. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. I, and this is that was for the benefit of those of you, and I know that you're out there, who are like, well, what if we invest in this company, right? Or I'm, what do you think of that company, right? Um, when you say like a specific company, the next information that you should be looking for or asking about is earnings. Like, in, And I think the point of that slide, too, is that that information is available. Professional investors follow it like hawks, right? I mean, so the information is available. The information is public. The information is super important. So if you are kind of moving into this realm of investing in individual names, um, in the stock market, you need to know the earnings piece, and it is available, and it's free, and it's it's out there for you to know. Um, so if we kind of aggregate um, or take that information and kind of look at earnings in the aggregate, this is a chart that I think solidifies this relationship between price and earnings. Right. Again, I think I've said this earlier in this call, but a lot of the, what I hear very often is this idea that the stock market is a casino or that it's a Ponzi scheme is the one I hear most often, um, that it's um, a, that it's like un, it's unknowable. And that is true in the short term. I very much believe that in the short term, not the Ponzi scheme part, but in the short term, it is like a casino. Right. Because from day to day it's impossible to know which way the stock market's going to go. Um, but over long periods of time, the reason I show this chart is to see this relationship over long periods of time between earnings and stock prices. Earnings are the fundamental underpinning of stock prices. A company or a group of companies' ability to generate profits, also known as earnings, is the fundamental underpinning of the stock market. Absolutely. And so here on this chart, um, on the left-hand side of the y-axis in the gold, we have S&P 500 earnings. So the S&P 500 is an index, it's basically a list of 500 very large U.S. companies. Every time a company reports earnings, someone at S&P plugs it into a little spreadsheet. Um, I'm sure it's automated, right? But plugs it into a spreadsheet and adds it up. So you can know what the basket of stocks that is the S&P 500, you can know how many dollars of earnings it generated. That's the gold line. In the y-axis on the right-hand side, we have the S&P 500 index. This is the price 
of that basket of stocks. So that's the white line. And on the bottom, we have this going back to 1988. So over a pretty long period of time. So just eyeballing this, you can see that they are kind of closely correlated with each other, right? Generally speaking, when the white line goes up or when the gold line goes up, which is earnings, the white line goes up. And it's not perfect. They're not perfectly on top of each other, but they are related to each other. Um, so we look at this. I mean, I know some of you have seen this over time, time, time and time again. Um, and so you, maybe you can remember looking at this chart in March of 2020, right? Or in August of 2020 and being like, oh my God, where is the gold line going to go, right? Now we can look back and see what happened to the gold line. It fell by a lot, right? During our most recent super fast and super extreme recession. And then the gold line recovered as companies in the economy recovered and started generating profits again. Going back to the idea of the stock market is forward looking, notice how the white line reacted before the gold line. So we've talked about that a lot in this group, that the stock market is trying to predict what is going to happen. If you're waiting for good numbers, you are going to be too late, right? And sometimes too late by a quarter, by six months, maybe nine months. If you waited for the numbers to be better, um, the stock market's already running away from you because the stock market is trying to predict the future. It's not perfect, right? It's often wrong, but it's on a trend, you know, like we're looking at a long-term trend, it's right a lot, enough of the time for you to respect that part of the market, right? So it, the gold line is the actual numbers that were reported. If you look up here in the upper right-hand corner, these boxes are estimates for the future. So there's a little box for 2021 earnings because we're just getting those now. So we don't actually know what they are, but we'll know by the end of the quarter what year-end 2021 earnings are. Then people are already making predictions about 2022 and 2023. So you can see here like, okay, um, this is, these are like Wall Street analysts who get paid to do these types of projections. People are assuming that earnings will be going up at a relatively good clip in 2022 and 2023. And the white line of the stock market is already anticipating that, right? So this forms like in the short term, this is a quandary, right? Because people often look at this and they're like, well, if the stock, if it's the beginning of 2022 and the stock market is already accounting for earnings growth in 2023, are we 24 months ahead? And is that too far, right? Like what if the earnings aren't as good, right? What if earnings go down? What if there's a recession? I mean, that would be bad for the white line, right? So there's a risk to being out here so far ahead of those earnings projections. Um, and there's also a risk to always being behind the curve and waiting for those numbers to come in because then you'll never really be there for these really massive runs up in the stock market. So in the short term, this is super tricky. Uh, and maybe this is a good place to point out, piggybacking off of Caitlin's comment, that you don't have to do it. You don't have to predict 2022 or 2023. If you eyeball this chart and can step way back 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you could say, well, there's going to be ups and downs. Right, like I can see that there's a there's a stock market bubble back in 2000. There's a financial crisis and a real estate bubble bursting in 2008, 2009. Those were pretty serious. The stock market fell by 50% in both cases. Um, there was a 20% decline at the end of uh, 2018, and then there was March of 2020, 
right, which is a 34% decline in S&P 500 in a month, I think it was three weeks. We were all there, right? Um, when you start narrowing your focus down to the short term, you are um, in danger of giving yourself unnecessary heartburn, I think, right? If you expand your time horizon and you say, okay, I'm in it for 10 years, uh, or I'm in it for 20 years or 30 years, then you can think back to this chart and be like, okay, I don't know how the market goes up, but I do think that the system's gonna work in the future like it has in the past. And according to these numbers, you know, what I often say is we expect the stock market to double every seven to 10 years. Sometimes it's five years, sometimes it's two years, like it almost has been over the last two years. Sometimes it's 12 years, right? Like there's no guarantee. It's our expectation. If you're not in something like the stock market, something where you can get relatively high rates of return, um, then your money is not going to double in seven to 10 years. If you're in cash, your money will double every, I don't know, let's call it like 70 years. And most of us don't have that much time to wait for our money to double. So it's a, it, like, what would you rather have, right? Would you rather kind of put the volatility of the stock market aside, just let it do its thing over the next 10, 20 years and expect to end up with doubling your money every seven to 10 years? Or would you rather not take that risk at all? I guess the other option is, would you rather, or would you like to micromanage this year by year and try to figure out what's going to happen in the short term so that you can be positioned correctly. Um, those are all like, I don't know, I think things to consider when we think about the stock market. Any questions on this chart, my favorite one? All right, what do we have on the next slide? Oh, okay. All right, so here are the role of different assets in diversified portfolio, right? We're, talk we're here talking about the stock market. The stock market for most people is how we generate wealth, but it's not the only thing we own. This is just a super simple chart showing US stocks. Um, so this is the S&P 500, the little legend up in the upper left-hand corner is the S&P 500. So the green line is stocks, the blue line is US bonds. Um, it's the, Bar it used to be called the Barclays Ag. No, I don't remember what the ETF is called. It's the ETF with the um, ticker symbol AGG. So it's just a basket of bonds. And this goes back to, what, 2007? So, okay, if we go back to 2007, we've gone through some stuff since then. If you had been in bonds, you would be on the blue line, right? Super steady for all that time. And you're on that blue line, and you're not losing money, and you are not making money over the long run, right? This is a good choice for that part of your portfolio that you need to be safe, you need to be stable, right? But it is not going to generate wealth. Um, I mean, I can't say that with a guarantee, but mathematically, it's almost guaranteed that you're not really going to make any game-changing or life-changing amounts of money, but you, it will be relatively safe in most cases. The green line is the S&P 500, so that's the stock market. So you can see in 2007, Right off the bat, we're in the market for a couple of years and then we have a financial crisis and the stock market falls by 50%. And it is horrible, right? It is just a horrible feeling for that to happen. But eventually the companies in, this, in the stock market, the companies in the economy stop losing money and then they even start making money. And so earnings start ticking up and stock prices start ticking up along with it. We have a pretty long expansion. Then kind of starting in 2008, it starts looking like maybe the expansion will end at the end of 2008, going right into Christmas Eve. The stock market fell by 20% between basically October 1st and December 24th. I remember because people were asking me about it at my family's Christmas party. And then it recovered. And then we're getting ready for March of 2020, which again, we all remember stock market fell by 34% in three weeks and then started recovering. And here's where we are today. You had to get through so many major catastrophes to get to this 229% return on your investment. But if you hung in there, 
you got there, right? So this is the power of time. Time heals a lot of wounds in the stock market, um, but it is rough getting there, right? Anyone who knows anything about the stock market, right? And we have now we have like these fresh wounds that we can refer back to, right? Um, but if you look at it mathematically, most of us would rather have something closer to the 229% versus the 13%. And you can kind of pick, you know, where if you blended these two things together and you had some stocks and some bonds, your line would be in the middle, right? Like when the stock market falls, you wouldn't fall by that much. When the market goes up, you don't go up by that much and you're somewhere in the middle. So you can take these characteristics of these two asset classes and blend them together in whatever percentage you think you can tolerate. Um, the worst thing, I think, like one of the worst things is to end up in a portfolio that's more aggressive than you can actually tolerate because that's what um, triggers people to sell during declines. Um, and it can be and it can be devastating. So here, what do we have here? So from 2019 to 2022, so just kind of zooming in a little bit on our most recent stock market catastrophe in March of 2020, everything was going fine until it wasn't. Then everything was going horrible until it stopped. We had kind of the shortest recession in recent history and the most dramatic decline in rebound in the stock market. Uh, most stock market recoveries are not this fast. This really does look like a V. Um, most of the time, uh, the recovery in the stock market is longer. So if we can you go back to the last slide? If we go back to 2008, 2009, uh, this decline in during the financial crisis, it took about five and a half years to get back to where you started versus the three months it took in 2020. If I was setting my expectations, I would worst case scenario or very bad case scenario a five year recovery in the stock market versus a 90 day recovery in the stock market um, with such like a such a dramatic decline. But Sarah. Um, do, do you think the short decline, do you think maybe that'll happen more frequently since, I don't know, everything seems to be revved up more with all of the uh, computer trading and, and I don't know, it just seems like information passes around so much faster. I wonder if that will affect how, how quick the market would come back. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I would guess that it's not necessarily a function of um, like algorithmic or computer trading. And it's more in this case, it's very clear that on that, the, on the day after the Federal Reserve stepped in and said they were going to help pacify the bond market and Congress said that they were going to pass the CARES Act, those are what stopped that decline. Um, that did not happen in, um, during the financial crisis. Right. And so you had this monetary policy is what the Fed does. They um, fiddle with interest rates, very short term interest rates. And then they can do something called quantitative easing, which is um, basically buying bonds in the marketplace. It makes things more liquid, just general, just all over the place. So the Federal Reserve did that on like the Monday that the stock market bottomed. The next day you started seeing the recovery. And then that was in conjunction with a bipartisan effort. Um, which we've never had, right? A bipartisan effort to be like, hey, this is no one's fault. We are going to help people. We do not want people to fall into poverty because of this. Checks are on the way. So those two things together really made it that steep. I don't know if you can count on that going forward. You can probably count on some help from the Federal Reserve. Like they want, they do not want people to fall into poverty. They do not want recessions. They don't want unemployment. Um, but I don't know if you can expect that from Congress going forward. I guess it depends on who's in Congress, right? And who and what can get passed. Um, but that's a really good question. I think these smaller ones, like the smaller dips in recoveries, I don't know if those, I mean, those are kind of normal for the stock market, but I do think those happen pretty fast. Um, and maybe that's kind of computers and speed of information type of stuff. Um, the that's other a really good question. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks for answering it. I was curious. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to mention is like there's a lot of people in the comments that are saying, you know, they they want to go ahead and do the funds or the ETFs. So 
uh, if they were going to look at like the big chart or even this one um, to, to get something that had that kind of returns, they would be looking at like an S&P ETF or something like that, or, or some, I know they have ETFs that focus just on U.S. stocks. Yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's right. Um, so this chart, the green line, which is the S&P 500, the ETFs you'd want to look at are VOO, which is the Vanguard S&P 500 index fund. SPY is the most famous one. I think that's the iShares ETF. Oh man, what's the Fidelity one? Anyone know the Fidelity one? I can't think of it off the top of my head. But if you just Google S&P 500 ETF, probably three or four or five would come up. And they all just hold the same stocks that are in the S&P 500. They just hold them in a way that you can actually invest in them. And they charge you a little super teeny tiny fee for doing that. But those are the ticker symbols you'd want to look at. And then you're going to chart this green line as close as you could possibly chart it. There will be very little drag from expenses. Awesome. Okay. Thanks. We can come back to that like specific fun stuff too, maybe in the Q&A, if there's more questions on that. That's a really good question. Um, here's just a little chart we put together that's showing one month. So it's always whenever you're looking at charts, it's important to know what timeline you're looking at, right? Because this the one month chart looks really different from our two year chart. Um, so things are a little rough out there. Right. So we can just see here the volatility going back kind of mid-December. Um, the yellow line is the NASDAQ. So that's another index. It tends to have more tech companies in it. So we often use it as a proxy for technology companies. It's not all tech, but it's tech heavy, I would say. And then the green line, again, is the S&P 500. And the blue line is AGG, uh, the, so the bond fund. So you can see here like, okay, like the stock market over the last month was up and then down, then up going into the end of the year and then down, especially in the case of the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ has really sold off um, in the first part of January. And that is interesting because over uh, the last quite a few years, 10, 15 years, the NASDAQ tends to do better than the S&P 500, but that relationship um, has kind of broken down over the last uh, several months, if not year, that the NASDAQ is underperforming the S&P 500. Um, so I don't know, like, I think that's interesting. Maybe you guys don't think it's interesting, but I'm just throwing it out there, right? That there's, um, the last month has been quite volatile. So speaking of which, let's go back to what Uncle Warren says about investing in stocks. Uh, you shouldn't own common stocks if a 50% decrease in their value in a short period of time would cause you acute distress, right? Um, the stock market is volatile. Like it, you have to always know that you are exposed to that when you're investing in the stock market. So now uh, that was all kind of like the background information. And I know I just said, like, let's not focus on the short term, but at the same time, that's what the theme of this uh, meeting is. So fundamentals of investing in 2022. So uh, let's do it. Let's kind of think through the next year and maybe think through what we maybe want to be concerned about or want to ignore or want to sound smart at parties. I don't know, like whatever your thing is. So I put together these four bullets for what I believe to be the fundamentals of investing in 2022. And there's actually really only one as of right this very second, and that's inflation is the story of 2022. Um, inflation has not been a thing for a really long time. Um, and because they're in the headlines, the inflation prints are in the headlines, now everybody's talking about it, right? And inflation is a big component in investing. So uh, it has become very important to talk about. Um, the main controversy or debate is the better uh, word for that is, is inflation temporary, which means short-term, or permanent? Are we in a new inflationary, long-term inflationary regime? Um, my answer is I don't know. Um, you know, people, economists, there actually is no really good theory of inflation. There's, most people can't really explain like a way to predict inflation. You think that you know what it is, right? Because it seems very obvious that it's an increase in prices, right? 
And if people have more money and uh, they're spending more and there's too few goods, then prices go up. And that's what inflation is. Right. Um, and that is true. But there are a lot of different forces in the economy that are inflationary, but they can be counteracted by different forces that are disinflationary or even deflationary. Um, and so that is like just the, the top line number that we end up with is really difficult to predict. Um, I mean, and it's just like we could theoretically like do a whole two hours just talking about the different pieces of inflation, um, how inflation shows up in our lives. Um, it is really, really complex. So it is difficult for me to kind of come up with this unified theory of inflation projections going forward. I will say like when I think about inflation, when I used to do projections um, a couple of years ago, I would kind of key in 2% inflation or 2.3% inflation. And now I key in 2.5. So not four, not seven, right? Um, but something a little bit higher than the run rate from before. Um, but we'll see, right? It's kind of like a evolving process. Um, one of the things that's disinflationary that I always think is interesting to, to think about, one is the main one is technology. Technology can make things cheaper. And um, the other is something called the velocity of money. It's the idea of like how fast do dollars change hands? Um, in the people that I talk to, I have not seen that many people who are increasing their spending by a lot. If anything, I'm seeing people get scared of inflation prints and starting to pull back on their spending to get ready for whatever is going to happen. And that seems like a little um, contradictory. But um, there, I mean, those are just two of what might be a thousand different factors that go into what causes inflation or how do we end up with high inflation prints. Um, if we do have persistently high inflation um, in the stock market, that is bad for growth stocks. And I'll show you why. I actually have a spreadsheet that I'm going to pull up. I'm really nervous about it because I've never done it before. But I'm going to pull up a spreadsheet. Growth stocks are very sensitive to changes in inflation. And value stocks, which are stocks that tend to trade at lower P.E. ratios, they tend to be considered undervalued. Um, if inflation is going to be higher persistently, it will be rough for growth stocks and good for value stocks. Um, this kind of idea of a great rotation has come up before and pooped out, right? So it's not a for sure thing. It's not the first time that anyone thought of this idea of the great rotation. Um, all the other times, not all the other times, but in the recent past, it's always pooped out and growth has continued to outperform. So growth stocks tend to be technology driven for the companies like in that tech space or using technology to, um, you know, in their industry more effectively than other companies. Uh, so if it's true, then there might be for those of us, I put myself in this camp of a growth investor, we might be in for a period of time where people are not in the mood for what we do, right? <laughs> where growth investing is out of style and out of fashion. So, um, and so this reason, like why inflation or how inflation can affect the stock market, I want to illustrate with a spreadsheet. Again, I'm not totally sure if this is going to be successful or not, but I'm just going to go for it because I'm the high risk, high return uh, investor here. So um, Gwen, can you stop sharing yours? And I'm going to try to share my spreadsheet here to try to explain. I really debated whether I was going to actually do this like on a call, but for you guys, I'd do anything. So we'll see if this works. Um, so this is like tying inflation to the stock market. That's what I'm trying to do here. All right, can you guys see my, my Excel spreadsheet? Okay, cool. All right, I'm gonna try to walk everybody through this as I go, and I'm gonna try to not lose myself. Okay, so up here in the upper left-hand corner, what I'm trying to show is how big changes in an expectation affect stock prices. So this is just stock ABC. I'm just making this up as I go. And here, um, 
let's say in 2021, so last year, this company earned $100 in earnings, right? So it made profits of $100. Um, let's assume that this is like a pretty high growth company. Um, it's growing its earnings where the people that we expect it to grow its earnings by 15% per year. I'm to put that 15% in this green box here. But see here that over time, the impact of that 15% growth rate over time, each year on the spreadsheet, earnings increased by 15% from the previous year. So by 2032, um, earnings is at $465 per share. Um, we're gonna kind of skip this part in for now and come back to it and come down here to forward inflation expectations. So let's say in 2001 that we all expected inflation to be at about 2% per year in the future. If we come down here to my little chart, we have our 2% inflation expectation. Let's say that we expect that real return over inflation. Let's go back to the chart before and say we expect it to be 6%. Remember the chart where we talked about like, okay, if um, the nominal rate was nine and inflation was three, then our real rate of return was six. So I'm just gonna put six in here. Now we can use time value of money to try to calculate the present value of this stock. So instead another way, we're trying to get an idea of what should this stock be worth today based on what we think its earnings will be in the future, 10 years in the future. Um, so if we come back up, to the calendar, what I did was way out here, fast forward to 2032. I made some assumptions here in 2032, where I said, okay, if we think that earnings will be $465 per share, and we assume that at that point in time, people will want to pay a PE ratio of 20 or 20 times earnings for this stock, which is a reasonable assumption for a growth stock, then the price of this stock should be $9,304 at that point in time. So I, then I use that information and say, well, if we think it's gonna be worth $9,300 10 years in the future, that's our future value. If we have 10 years to get there, that's our number of periods or our number of years. Um, let's say this company doesn't pay a dividend, so there's no additional money coming into us. And we expect inflation to grow at about 2% per year on average. And for investing in the stock market, we want an additional 6% on top of the 2%. So now we backed into, okay, in order for us to make this investment under these assumptions, we need at least, we need to expect at least an 8% annual rate of return. So when we solve for present value, that means that, okay, if we, we would want to buy this stock for $4,309, hold on to it for 10 years, and then sell it for $9,305. Then we get our 8% rate of return, which is 6% above inflation. Is this making any sense? Or are you kind of trusting me at my word? In my <laughs> Lori, what do you think? Um, I think I think keep going. Okay. So I'm going to take this control C and I'm going to paste it down here and say, okay, let's paste our values down here. Okay. So that means today, if we can buy this stock for $4,300, that would fit our parameters as investors. So now let's come up here and say, well, okay, well, what happens when over three months or six months or one month, all of a sudden things change. And now instead of 2% inflation rate, everybody at the same time pivots and says, oh crap, it's not 2%, it's 4%. When we put that number into our same formula down here, our expected inflation rate goes to four. And we can keep everything else the same under this assumption. Now our, we call it our discount rate, it's our R in our time value of money calculation goes from eight to 10. And what that does is it 
decreases the present value of that same stock. So to get, we would now want to buy this stock at $3,587 so that we can get 10% per year, which is 6% above inflation, and sell it for $9,300 10 years in the future. Higher discount rates, higher inflation rates will mean just mathematically, oops, that the present value of assets is going to go down unless something else offsets it. So now if we're in 2022 here, and we're trying to make this decision today, at the beginning of the month, in January or last month, we would have thought that $4,300 was a good price to pay for the stock. But now we think that $3,587 is a good price, a better price to pay for this stock because of the higher inflation. So the price of that stock would come down, and this is showing a 16.8% decline in order to bring those numbers, that price, back into line with our 6% real rate of return target. So when people are saying, you know, especially for growth stocks, this high growth rate number becomes more susceptible to these uh, changes in inflation rates. Um, those, those bigger earnings numbers in year 10 and beyond become less valuable in today's dollars because of the higher inflation rate leading to the higher nominal rate of return that we need to get to the same end goal. Does anyone want to ask a question about this? Did that help at all or did it make it worse? I'm just going to go with it helped. Well, if anyone has any questions, we can certainly come back to this. Let, but let me. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to see if I could summarize. Um, basically, you figured out how much the stock would be worth in 2032 in order to make the kinds of returns that you expected. And then you calculated out um, with inflation how much how much return you would have to get. So you want a 6% return. And so when inflation goes up, you have to have a higher return. So you basically, when inflation goes up, you have to have a higher return. So you don't want to spend as much on the stock because you still have to get to that end point. Um, so you don't want to spend as much on the stock. So since you're not willing to spend as much on the stock, other people aren't either. So the price of that stock goes down and therefore the value of the stock goes down. Like, oh, if it was Tesla and it was $400 today, people are gonna think, well, you know, that's gotta be worth a lot in 10 years and inflation's going up. So I'm not gonna pay $400, I'm only gonna pay 350. So the next day, Tesla is only going for 350. Yeah. And, and it's a stock that's only worth 350. Nobody wants to pay more than that. Um, so, so therefore, the prices of the stocks tend to go down because everybody's figuring this stuff out. All the people who know what they're doing, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that was perfect, Lori. It's like, remember that we're all investors in the same market, right? And so if investors, we tend to have dramatic swings when everybody changes their mind at the same time. Um, and I will say like, this is still like, a, it's a theme, it's a trend of people starting to put these higher inflation numbers in their models. This is a super simplified, simplified version of a model that an investment banker on Wall Street would have. Um, but it's the same concept, right? It's just the concept. And so here it's all things being equal. If inflation is higher, the present value is lower. 
That's making a giant assumption that all things are equal, right? Because there are lots of assumptions in here that we did not fiddle with and we did not change the expectations. Um, so that the, the system in and of itself is way more complex, but that's what the concept is right now. When people say, well, why is the NASDAQ falling so much farther than the S&P 500? The NASDAQ has more high growth stocks in it than the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is a mix of growth and value. So the top 10 holdings in the S&P 500 are something like Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Alphabet, which is Google, um, JP Morgan Chase, which is a bank, value stock, Berkshire Hathaway, value, um, and then a couple of other ones I can't remember, right? So the S&P 500 is a mix, and the NASDAQ is more heavily weighted towards technology. So those high growth stocks, the NASDAQ, in the first part of 20. 22 and in 2021 was behind the S&P 500 because of this idea that people are becoming less interested in growth stocks at this price and more interested in value stocks because they tend to have lower prices relative to earnings. So I will say this is again like all things being equal. We are in the middle of earnings season where everybody's going to be trying to figure trying to figure out what these earnings expectations going forward are because that's all that matters. So like kind of a, a I don't know like a chink in this armor of this rotation from growth to value on Friday banks are value stocks. Um, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, and Citigroup announced their earnings on Friday, and it did not look good. Their earnings, their forward earnings, look like they'll be weaker than people expected. So those stocks, except for Wells Fargo, Citigroup, and um, J.P. Morgan fell. And people started thinking like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe this like growth to value thing is more complicated than we thought it would be. If all of these value companies come in and say, hey, business is great, so it's gonna be wonderful, then we would expect those stocks to participate in that. But if those value companies announce their actual numbers and are like, oh, this is actually kind of rough, then maybe this great rotation doesn't actually happen. Um, so I know like this has kind of went from like intro to stocks to like models in spreadsheets. Um, but I wanted to have a little bit for everyone uh, in the meeting today. So certainly, like, I'm happy to pull up the spreadsheet again. The main thing that I'm trying to put out there is that, one, it's super complicated. Um, two, if there is a change in inflation expectations over the long run, it will matter to the stock market. Hey, Sarah, Rhiannon has a really good question, I think, that might um, also help summarize in addition to um, Lori's summary. So uh, Rhiannon's question is, I'm confused about if I'm buying for the long term and inflation is going to go up and down, why am I concerned about the price today? Isn't it still a bargain if it goes down? Um, yeah, it depends on your timeline. That's a great question, right? Um, so here, like, you know, like in this part of the talk, like, we kind of pivoted to 2022, right? Like what are things like we can be thinking about for the next year? I mean, if you're Caitlin and like not even paying attention right now, right? Like you're not, it doesn't matter, right? Cause you're in it for the long run. <laughs> hey, Sarah Leanne, right? And so that's a really good question. Like if you're in it for the long run, do you need to know that this is happening? I would say like maybe vaguely because when you get your brokerage statement and your QQQ ETF, is down by 15% and you have a question about it, like that's going to be your answer, right? Most likely. Um, but if you get your statement and QQQ is down by 15% and you're like, eh, what are you going to do? I'll come back in 20 years. Then by that time, this whole inflation thing will have gone through a gazillion different cycles and will have worked itself over, out over time. So I would say like if you are truly a long-term investor and you're used to the ups and downs of the market, and like you're like, okay, this is just how it is. Then yeah, just keep doing your thing, right? Um, if you 
are more focused on the short term or just like um, having an explanation around the performance numbers that you're seeing on things that used to be awesome and now aren't, this is your explanation. That was a really good question. Did that help at all? Thank you, because my <laughs> number one reaction to all of this much like my reaction to the interest statement was la 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 <laughs> I never want to have to know about this and what could I do about it anyway so I just was able to chime in at the end with confirmation that if I'm in it for the next 30 40 50 60 years inflation's going to happen it's not going to happen it's going to be bad it's going to be not bad I'm still here earning the money today to put into those accounts like totally. there's nothing else I can do right because in that same thing, like we saw that when inflation goes up, that the prices of the stocks go down, it happens in reverse too. If inflation comes down and doesn't end up at 4%, the opposite's gonna happen, right? Those prices will come back up. So that's, it is part of like the cyclicality of the market. Um, and it kind of comes down to like this third point, like how confident are you in predicting inflation? You should not be confident at all. It's so hard, right? Um, like right now, there's these thing called base effects. That means like, okay, if we're, if we're measuring year over year inflation, where are we starting from? If we're starting from numbers in a pandemic, those are weird numbers, right? And so there's base effects that are taking a hold. The whole supply and demand issue is totally out of whack. We all know about the supply chain, right? We all know about like the worker situation. Um, we all know that, you know, well, maybe we don't all know, but consumers still have jobs and money in their pocket and want to spend it. And it's causing this supply and demand mismatch. Maybe that's persistent. Maybe it works itself out. Um, but there's there's also all these global pieces to it, right? That how investors, do they want to come in and um, buy bonds in um, like, will in, will Will global investors like import deflation um, and maybe start factories that are closed right now because of COVID? What if those factories come back online, more stuff gets sent and prices come down? There's just all of these things and I, uh, you, you should not be confident in predicting inflation. Um, the Federal Reserve has the most qualified economists in the world working for it. And they've been saying like, we think this is gonna work itself out. That doesn't mean they're infallible. But it means like if it's, you know, the, the economists at the Federal Reserve or like your uncle at the Christmas party, like each having an opinion as to how inflation is going to work out over long periods of time, like at least like weigh the economist's opinion. Right. Um, and it's also like it's hard because we experience inflation in a way that makes it seem like we are experts in it, um, which is, you know. I'm not saying inflation is not real. Like that's, you know, like we are experiencing it, but we also tend to extrapolate into the future without taking other things into consideration. And we do that with stock market investing. We do that with investing all the time. Um, and then the short term versus long term, right? So all, like, do you need to get the inflation call right in order to make money over the long run? No. Um, and this idea of diversification does cover most of your bases, right? Or if you're only in Tesla, it's, you might have some short-term pain this year if this happens in 2022. Um, maybe if like you signed up for that and you're just gonna ride it out, that's awesome, right? But if you're in an S&P 500 index fund, some of those companies are gonna do well, some of them are gonna do poorly. They're gonna kind of even out over time and hopefully you're on that upward trajectory over long periods of time. Awesome. Ooh, now we have some polls. Okay, let's like kind of jam through these. I'm so excited. All right, everybody. So if you get your phone, we're going to do some polls and I kind of want to see what you guys think. This is your chance to predict the markets in 2022. So we've got this cool polling software. It will not spam you and we pay for this. So it is not like ad supported. And, um, of course, if you have any concerns, don't use it. But um, if you're able to, it's just kind of fun to do some results. So when Gwen gets it pulled up, it's going to, um, Gwen, are you still here? Oh, I didn't lose her because she's the only one running the polls. Oh, there she is. Sorry, sorry. 
some technical difficulties. Yeah. Um, give me a second to get logged in and then we'll have the poll on the screen. Yeah. So I'm just gonna talk really slow for a second. We're gonna have three or four polls and we're gonna try to get through them. You're gonna use your phone to vote and then it's gonna show the screen. We're gonna do a couple different polls. One is just like, um, how do you think the stock market's gonna do? One of the other polls is one of those word clouds. So on the word clouds, try to see what other words are popping up on the screen. And if you have the same idea, Try to use the same word because then the word will get bigger. Um, so that's just a tip from having done this over the last couple of years. Okay, so now you can use your phone. You can either pull up your text box and text your vote to this number here. Um, what I did was use my QR code, use my phone, use the QR code. It pops up in my browser. And now I'm looking at a poll that has my options. So now I can see, okay, how will the stock market do in 2022? Hmm. Oh, this is awesome. If, if you are texting in, make sure that you're texting the number of the um, answer that you want to send in, not the actual word um, oh, so that you can count your, your answer. All right, so we're a pretty optimistic bunch here. Oh, Ew. All right. maybe not, maybe all the optimists voted back. All right, no, this is, this is pretty good. Oh no, all right. I'm gonna give you just another 20 seconds or so. All right, okay. So we have a few people who think it's gonna be awesome and great. We have the majority of people who voted thinks it'll be good, right? And notice how like we didn't really put percentages in there. Um, fine. And then we have a couple people who are like, oh, not so good. But we don't really have anyone who thinks it's gonna be bad or terrible. That is very interesting. All right, what's our next poll, Gwen? Okay. Oh. You want to go back to the other one? Do we have the word cloud one before that? Thank goodness for Gwen. When I was the couple times, maybe some of you guys were there when I would have to try to do this all at the same time, right? Like the the slides and then the poll and I'd be logged out and then I couldn't remember how to do it. So thank you, Gwen, for falling on the sword and actually making this happen. I'm um, sweating so hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Everybody is so grateful that it's you doing it. Okay, so this is the word cloud one. Right. So if you can do the same thing, if you're texting it in, it's like a word or a phrase that you are thinking, why might the stock market do well in 2020? So there's, um, it can be any reason, any reason that you think. Oh, you might have to hit play on that one. When do you need to start that one? Yeah, sorry. Okay, it should be ready. Sorry, y'all. Okay, I'm going to assume that, co yeah, COVID fatigue, pent up like COVID related ones mean like people are just, they're, they're over the lockdowns. All right, so these are good. Supply chain recovers, that's a good one. Got a couple COVID ones. Increased production going along with the supply chain recovery. Ooh, whoever used the acronym TINA, I like. FED, awesome, FOMO, which stands for fear of missing out, for those of you who might not know what FOMO means. FED is for the Federal Reserve. Is the Federal Reserve gonna keep things going? You explained oh, FOMO, but not Tina. 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> Tina stands for there is no alternative. It's the idea that if you have dollars, like what else are you going to do, right? Are you going to put them in cash at 0%? Are you going to put them in bonds at 1%? Or are you just like going to hold your nose and put them in stocks because you need a higher rate of return than what you're able to get anywhere else? Thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> All right, these are really good. Oh, more Tina. Yes, as soon as I explained it, then people are into that idea. That was a really strong one, Tina. That has been like a, a really big driver. Like I see that all the time talking to people. It's, um, I have so much money in cash. It earns 0% and now there's inflation. I feel like I'm falling farther and farther behind. What do I do, right? So it's like this idea that people who would all things being equal, prefer to keep their money in cash, um, but are just being like forced out of it because of the persistently low interest rates on very safe investments. Awesome, really good. Okay, these are all good. All right. So I had some on a list, right, that I'll just kind of pull up and just kind of show you what my thoughts were on, on some of the things that might be under consideration for 2022. And it's also kind of trying to guess what's on people's minds. So it's not like, they're, they're just like reasons to be optimistic, I feel like. Um, so it's kind of, if you were making the bullish case for stocks, bullish means that prices will go up in the stock market. So if you're making the bullish, bullish case for stocks, you'd probably say, hey, there's this rebound in the U.S. economy. This kind of comes back to COVID fatigue, people getting out and spending money. Um, consumers have low debt and cash in their pockets. One of the, I think one of the most interesting things that came out of COVID was people took those stimulus checks and paid down their debt, which I just think is fascinating. Um, vaccines and pent up demand for a post-COVID world. So that's our COVID fatigue. Um, kicking in, everybody's ready to kind of get back to something that looks like normal. Um, stocks tend to be good inflation hedges over the long run, right? So if there is inflation, I mean, getting sitting in cash is going to only get more painful, right? Um, or being in bonds at one or two percent interest, if inflation is at four, it's going to be way too painful. Like, what are your alternatives? So that's kind of like the Tina argument. Um, the Fed is probably going to keep rates relatively low and can manage the yield curve. We, I won't make you guys talk about the Fed at all, but we'll do that in the future maybe. Inflation will not be as high as feared. Maybe this is all just a blip and maybe it'll work itself out. Um, stocks are cheap versus bonds. That means you, you know, like based on what, like how little you can get in bonds, stocks are actually a better alternative. Um, and technology-driven innovation is just getting started. So that that part of the economy is still there it's still driving growth in certain sectors of the market and maybe even um, eating away at other parts of the market. So that kind of those growth technology stocks are actually the place to be even with inflation. All right, what's our next poll? Oh, that's our, these are our poll results from January, 2021 when we did it. So if you think back a year ago, this is what people were thinking about for 2021 and the reasons they gave for why the stock market might do well in 2021. So some of the same ones kind of pop up, COVID recovery, technology, stability was the big one, right? Like coming out of the elections, we knew what was gonna, we finally knew what was gonna happen, at least uh, from a political perspective. All right, cool. That's our next one. All right, so same thing. Why might stock market do poorly in 2022? So if you had to make the case for lowering your expectations, what would you say, right? So again, it's kind of the same thing, like with the word cloud, you know, as we go through, you kind of have to think like, okay, like what could derail this like pretty good recovery we saw last year again? So I think the stock market last year was up 25-ish percent, depending on what you were looking at. I think the S&P 500 was up 25%, but not everything was up. 25%, right? There were lots of things that were down. Um, there were some things that did better than 25%, but in the aggregate, if we're looking forward and maybe just like keeping um, the S&P 500 in mind, like where might, what might derail this stock market? 
refresh my poll. I love these word clouds, by the way, you guys. I think it's so interesting to see what everybody is thinking. So thank you for participating. It's so fun. All right, so we've got the Fed again in there. The Fed could be our savior or the harbinger of doom, depending on which way you look at it. Um, still COVID concerns, right? Rates rising too quickly goes kind of hand in hand with the Fed rate hikes. Um, so if you think back to 2018, I think we had this conversation at some point about the idea that eventually the Federal Reserve, if they raise rates too high, it mucks up the gears of the economy and we risk or actually go into recession, which is when the economy, instead of growing, when it contracts. Um, so that's already, which is so funny, that's the Fed hasn't even started raising rates yet, but there are parts of the market that are already like looking past the rate hikes to the recession that would come after, and we haven't even started the rate hikes yet, the increase in the short-term rates, right? So it's like the market is really looking pretty far ahead, like through that entire cycle to what comes after, which I think is really interesting, right? But again, like the market's looking forward, like, okay, if the Fed raises rates, to try to bring inflation down. If they raise them too much, it'll bring down inflation and cause a recession. Recessions will probably get rid of the inflation problem, by the way. But do you want people to lose their jobs? Do you want the economy to contract in order to fight inflation? Which would you rather have, inflation or jobs? They're, they're, a lot of people think that that's the, what the trade-off is. Um, it's very interesting, I don't know. All right, government can't pass bills. All-time highs, I like that one like the at or near all-time highs. Um, I think I took that chart out, Gwen, even though you helped me put it in, but maybe we'll, maybe we'll see what happens and revisit that later. Um, okay, cool, this is awesome, you guys. All right, so if we go to the next slide, I'll kind of make my bearish case. The bearish case for stocks, inflation will continue to stay high and the repricing of all those assets happens kind of in a disorderly fashion. Um, stock prices are high relative to 2022-2023 projected earnings. So going back to that chart and that the price line is close to what we think maybe it should be next year, um, that kind of leads into good news is already baked in. Uh, maybe we're already predicting the best it's going to be in 2023. We're just far ahead of it. The stock market is at or near all-time highs, the fear that we're due for a correction. Um, that's that's pretty commonly cited in the stock market world, like kind of this idea that we don't deserve to be or stay very long at all time highs. Um, earnings margins may be compressed by higher input costs and higher wages, right? So that means that those earnings that we're looking out, if your payroll is higher because you have to give everybody raises and um, maybe like your, uh, like other input costs are higher, then your profits smush, right? If, if they're not offset by revenues. So you can have something called earnings compression. That would be bearish for stocks. Um, not in this one, but often people will cite the national debt, budget deficit, student loan debt. Um, so there's uh, you know varying uh, evidence to support that that uh, adversely affects the stock market, but um, it could in the worst case scenario. All right, what else do we have? Our bearish case from last year. Oh, yeah. So this is interesting that the overvalued stocks concern was the biggest one a year ago, and then the stock market returned 25%, right? Like that would have been like a huge whiff in 2021, like trying to make that call for 2021. Like, I'm not going to invest. I'm going to wait till prices come down, and then the market runs away from you. Right. So, again, that does like tie back to the, the trap of falling into these short term projections. Um, if you get attached to one narrative. If the market does the opposite, the market can run in either direction. Right. If we zoom way out and say we're in it for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, it's easier to envision the cycles that are going to happen during that period of time 
And then we can just tell ourselves like, okay, we're just here riding the waves up and down. And that should be trending upward over long periods of time. We're not going to get too attached to making calls in the short term. All right, next slide. Which leads into, can you predict where the stock market is heading? This is a chart that we show pretty often, just showing over time, going back to 1957, these bad things that happen, either in the market or in the economy or globally, bad things happen all the time. That's another place where stock investors get caught up is, it's like, well, what about, you know, insert fear, right? Uh, there's always going to be something to be afraid of. And there's always going to be something that is going to talk you out of becoming an investor in the stock market. Uh, you just have to, I, you know, I think I said this in the past, you have to get comfortable with this feeling of uncertainty, right? Um, and that you can't control what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. But if we, again, if we look over longer periods of time, we can see this longer term trend that we expect to persist over long periods of time, regardless of what horrible thing is going to happen next. All right, next slide. Inve oh, yes, investment all-time highs. It's in there. Awesome. I love this chart because it shows um, how often, to me, like a surprising amount of time that the stock market spends at or near all-time highs. So the green and the blue part of the charts are when the market is within 5% of all-time highs, right? So that's 40 8% of the time, almost half the time, the stock market is at or near all-time highs. So if you didn't invest in the stock market when it was at or near all-time highs, there are long periods of time where you're just out, right? And that's, and because it's at or near all-time highs, that's when the market is going up, right? It keeps reaching all-time highs. And if we say 10% then all-time highs and add in the yellow parts, I mean, then we're well over 50%. 10% decline in the stock market, by the way, it's called a correction. It's like barely a blip in the market for people who are kind of used to being in this space. 20% is kind of serious. More than 20%, people usually start getting a little bit uncomfortable, but 10% is normal, right? So I just love this chart, like very, and I think I like it because it also shows how like the brief periods of time that the market spends more than 20% from its all-time highs. So those crash, those crashes that either feel like an opportunity or the time to bail out of the stock market. I would argue, and we've talked about this in the group a whole bunch, I would argue that if you have cash to invest and a long-term time horizon, crashes are opportunities, right? If you're trying to move from the red area back up to the green and blue areas. People can make a lot of money, but you need the risk tolerance to do it and the cash to do it. Um, so it does take a little bit of foresight and planning on how to, how to do that. All right, next chart. Ooh, has anyone changed their mind? How will the stock market do in 2022? All right, so let's take one more poll and see what we think. Did Were you talked out of your previous opinion? Were you talked into something else? Are you still kind of where you think you were? Huh. All right, all you optimists, where are you? Oh, dang, all right. Still have a couple greats, goods, fines. Sarah, we can't see the poll. Oh, Gwen, do you need to, I don't know who, what needs to happen, but we can't see it. Oh, dang, I can see it. Um, I, I can see it too. Is it people who are on? You don't see the poll I've had, Do you see the poll I results? I just see the, has anyone the changed that? I just see the slide that says, has anyone changed their mind? No. Oh. oh, so iPad situation, Never mind. Caitlin, did that fix it? I turned it off. Yes, turned it off. you're magic. <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. Awesome. Okay, so I feel like it skewed a little bit more towards good. I don't know where those votes came from. 
if they came from the great or the fine or the not good. But it seemed to like tick up a little bit. People were like, oh, maybe it'll be good. So we'll see. We'll meet again in a year and see what happens. All right. Next slide. Okay. So thoughts to take with you. I think we actually already touched on most of these and we're coming in like three minutes to spare. I'm happy to stick around for a little bit um, if uh, people have questions. Um, thoughts to take with you. Short-term predictions are hard. The system's too complex to be predictable. And even if you get the prediction right, you can get the outcome wrong, right? This really messed with people's heads in 2020, right? Because you can have a global pandemic and have the stock market go up at the same time, right? So even if you got the pandemic call right, you maybe didn't get the stock market part right because those things seem like they don't make sense. So that's like falling into the trap of predictions. It's such a complex system that making predictions is so hard. Um, diversification is your friend, right? So going to the broad market funds and ETFs. So we talked about like Vanguard, S&P 500 index fund, an even broader one is VTI, which is the Vanguard, wait, yeah, the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund, ticker symbol VTI, um, is even broader because it includes large companies and small companies. There are lots of broad stock ETFs and mutual funds that just have everything in there. So that's what I mean by invest across market caps. That means size of company, small, medium, large, industry, style, that's like growth versus value. You can just throw it all in there and just see what happens. Um, and I mentioned this before, if you prefer one style, sometimes you'll be out of fashion, right? That if you are a growth or if you're a value investor like Warren Buffett, you have been out of fashion for like 15 years, right? If you're a growth investor, you're not used to being out of fashion, but it might be happening, right? So just like kind of get used to that. If you pick one thing and aren't diversified, be ready for when you're not right for that period of time. That doesn't mean you're not going to be right over the long run or it's not going to work for you over the long run. Just be ready for that. You don't have to know everything. Capitalism is flexible. It'll adapt to changes. Um, nothing stays the same forever. Things are always changing and cycling. Stocks have always been long-term wealth generators so far. Um, you know, if you want to be in the stock market, uh, maybe because you do need to generate wealth, are you already wealthy? and you don't want to be, you know, in that wealth generating place, you want to be somewhere safer. These are all questions like that you, only you know the answer to. I think like for 2022, like the, the stealth theme is spending time on things that you can control. And so if the stock market or assets in general are going through this repricing that can be a little bit painful, what if you just set that aside and focus on something like your income potential? or your career, it has never been a better time to be in the workforce, right? You can just write your own job description and write your own, like ask for a raise. I've gotten so many emails from people who are like, oh, I got a $10,000 raise or I'm switching jobs and I'm gonna get more money, right? Like you are in demand, even if you've been out of the workforce, you are in demand. If you can make, an extra $5,000, $10,000 uh, upgrading your skills or changing jobs or focusing on your career. I think that's a pretty good use of your time versus trying to figure out where inflation is going to go um, in 2022 and beyond. Um, other things you can do, like refinance those debts. Interest rates are still low. Uh, pay off those credit cards. That's always number one. Um, and so there are other things that are things you can actually control, like getting your budget together, trimming here or there, those things will have a payoff and you don't have to guess. So um, I think that that's a, a pretty good place to kind of focus some of your time and energy. I think that's my last one. Oh my gosh, one minute late. All right, that was maybe the first time that's ever happened. Um, I am happy to stick around and answer questions. Let's call it for a 15 or 20 minutes. Um, for those of you who have been here the whole time, thank you. You're, you know, everyone's welcome to jump off whenever they need to. But if you have questions, um, I'm happy to stick around. And if you don't have questions, I'm super impressed. Either what I said was super boring or very clear. I don't know.
what happened in the chat box while uh, while I was talking? You're probably asking me. Oh, Lori, good. Okay. Oh, well, I, I was just going to say, uh, Emmy, did you have a question? Emmy, I noticed you unmuted your microphone. Did you have a question? No, I guess not. Uh, Nicole has a question. Nicole, do you want to go ahead and ask? Sure. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, Sarah, if you think that um, any bad news on inflation is priced into our current market. Yeah, I mean, I mean, afraid my, I'm afraid my follow up question is like, how bad is bad? <laughs> <laughs> or are you asking me how bad is bad? Um, yeah, I, I just feel like you know. Um, I mean, in my lifetime and in my adult lifetime, I've never lived through an inflationary period. So it's, you know, just kind of a, a big uh, area of unknown in terms of what to expect. I mean, I see tech stop, stocks dropping, you know, 40, 50%. Yeah. Um, is that just the tip of the iceberg? <laughs> I mean, or not? What an awesome question. I don't know. Um, I yeah. think that. My sense is that my sense is that for certain for certain companies, this earnings season is going to be really, really important, right? Like when companies report this quarter, especially for those uh, tech companies, like software companies, what everybody's going to be looking for is forward guidance, right? Like, are who, what are the companies that are able to show that they can still generate the same amount of profits going forward and that inflation does not impact them? Um, that's going to be super tricky, right? Because, like, the whole thing's like, okay, rising payrolls as wages go up, rising input costs. How does that flow through to earnings margins, profit margins, and what companies are so powerful on the pricing side that they're able to increase their revenue enough to offset those increased inputs and keep their profit margins? If a bunch of information starts coming in that, those in, that inflation has impacted way more of the um, expenses line items than people thought they would, then things could get pretty rough pretty fast. Um, so I don't know if all of the bad news is priced into the market. I do think there are probably a lot of people out there who are kind of like me and are like, we still have these disinflationary forces in our economy. We still have um, technology is a big theme. We still have um, of a, like an still a little bit of an aging workforce and then we have like an aging population outside of our country in the rest of the world um, that tends to offset inflationary pressures um but so if numbers start coming in that that's not actually true then things could get really rough especially in that growth and innovation sector where it's already been rough does anyone want to change their vote now on there on the poll. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> That's helpful. And I don't think that means like jumping in and out of things either. It might mean looking at your portfolio and seeing if you're all in one thing. And if you are, do you just want to ride this out and wait for like if it's growth, if you're just in growth, do you just want to wait it out? Um, that might be totally appropriate for some people. I would say I fall into that camp where I'm like, I'm still putting money in. I'm looking at like 10, 20 years and doing the math in my head. So I'm not going to be jumping in and out trying to jump from, you know, growth stocks to value to, you know, all of these things. Just like, okay, I've got my thing. I understand the risk reward trade-off. I know what my limits are. And so I'm just going to keep going with my thing. 
Um, but everyone has to figure that out for themselves, right? And for most people, that diversified portfolio, you know, some of the things are going to do well, some of them are going to bomb, they're going to offset each other over time, and you're going to fall into that kind of hopefully like eight, nine, 10% nominal rate of return over time with lots of ups and downs, but that's still like a totally reasonable way to go. And it's the easiest way to go, I think. Um, we did have one question on cryptocurrency. Um, basically, is that mainstream yet? Is it, would it be part of a diversified portfolio? And if I didn't, if I didn't phrase it right, um, whoever, <clears throat> excuse me, whoever, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> whoever asked can go ahead and speak up. Um, I mean, I think cryptocurrency is still, if you call it an asset class, you call it an emerging asset class. People don't know, what, there's not enough time to know what it does or what, I mean, like performance wise and what the risk return profile is. Um, I would say that again, like kind of uh, in all of the, like all of the research I've done and in my professional life, I do think it's an asset class uh, that in a diversified portfolio has a place, maybe between one and 5%, depending on how into that idea the client is. Um, but I do think it's also an asset class that people really need to opt into if they're, because the risk return profile of cryptocurrency, like if you're thinking about stocks, it's like, okay, well, we think they're going to return 10-ish percent, but it actually might be 30% or it might be negative 20%, right? Most of the time, which is a really wide range of outcomes. With cryptocurrency, it's like, well, like maybe it's like up a thousand percent or down 99%, right? It's like that range of outcomes is so wide that it's almost nonsensical, right? So that if you're putting money in, I would think like, okay, like if you put a small amount of money in and get a big payoff, that is good. If you put a small amount of money in and it bombs, if you can recover from it. That's still how I view the risk return profile of cryptocurrency. So it's not 100% crypto because um, that just seems like very aggressive. Um, but on that note, we are having a cryptocurrency meetup next month, everybody, for February. So we're gonna be sending out that invitation soon. It's, we have partnered with our very good friends from Investera to do um, investing in cryptocurrency uh, seminar for you guys and to lead that topic, which is something we all need a, a trusted and vetted expert to walk us through. So that uh, so bring all of your crypto questions next month. We're super excited to be able to do this with someone that we know and trust um, and who will be able to answer your questions. And Leora, you can bring your allergic to crypto questions too. They're gonna be there to answer all the questions. And they're like, they're not, there's no pitch, there's no, like they're into the crypto idea, but they are going to give you the straight dope on investing in crypto. So um, I think it'll be really fun. I think Tatiana had um, a hand up. So Tatiana, if you want to unmute and ask your question to the group. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for your information. Uh, you. We talked a while ago. I don't know if you remember. We chat, you know, my husband, we are separated. It came out of nowhere. And I was um, 17 years mom living in bubble and not knowing finances. So I'm learning now. What I would like to do, we are still functioning as a married, but I would like, and we have our stocks in Schwab, but I would like to start my own index, Vanguard. But at the same time, I would like for my kids, would you recommend um, rather in the beginning open one account and then later kind of branch out for my kids? or start all three of us separate? Oh, that's such a good question. And without like, you know, let, like super knowing the details, I would say like on questions like that, like, you know, my, my inclination is for you as the parent 
to keep control over all of the assets until you are willing to officially hand them over to your kids. How old are your kids? Well, my daughter is 18. She's going to college. My son yeah. is 15. I would yeah. like to get them contribute monthly also, kind of, yeah. you know, one way saving money, at the same time learning about finances. Yeah. I would say if they are contributing, then open their own accounts that they can put their own money in. I if see. you are if you are earmarking money for them, I would keep it in your name until that earmark gets distributed. So you well, know if it's like what money would be coming from me to them. And them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think maybe, and I think there's some other people like on the group where we've talked about this. Um, like I think in that case, it's um, maybe something like if it's a Roth IRA and your daughter puts in a thousand dollars, you match it in some capacity. Okay. Um, something like that, but with you being in a somewhat, maybe like if you are in a vulnerable financial place, I would keep control of the resources until you are in a less vulnerable place. Got it. Okay. Then I don't have an account yet. I'm just literally in the process. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, would that be like some advisor? to talk to before I open, like, should I open a Roth ARR or, or, you know, all these details, that tiny details, yeah. or is it basically on my own setting up? If you're already at Schwab, Schwab has advisors who can walk you through the process. Oh, okay. Um, and so I would at least reach out to them. Um, Vanguard has the same thing. So I know there's people on the call who have, uh, like Caitlin does Vanguard and has had good uh, customer service experience. Um, uh, so I know people have relatively good experiences with the representatives and the advisors that are available through uh, Schwab, Vanguard, Fidelity. So I would at least talk to someone and not okay. try to do everything on your own and just see what really? they say. Okay. Awesome. And Tatiana, uh -huh. I just want to say one thing. So Sarah and I do a podcast and our episode eight last week was the title was literally, how do I start investing? <laughs> And oh, Sarah that's... walks through yeah. someone okay. who is just needs to start an account, everything you need to do to do that. So I think I'll put it again in the chat so you can see it there. Um, okay. But it's really for people starting at the beginning to answer all these questions for you. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. All right. We probably have time for one more. All right. Well, on that note, I just want to thank everyone again for coming. Um, this is uh, the stock market is my passion topic, so I'm always so excited to be able to talk to you guys about it. Um, if anyone has any questions, reach out through Meetup or reach out through Blackburn Financial or Women on the Verge of a Financial Breakthrough is also always looking for questions. Um, so there's lots of ways to get in touch with us um, if you have any questions. And um, until we see each other again in February and March, um, I hope you guys all have a safe month and uh, have a nice uh, have a nice rest of the weekend. All right, we'll see y'all later. Thank you, Sarah. Bye, guys. Thanks. Lori, feel better. <laughs> Luckily, I feel better already, but I can stay at home in quarantine. <laughs>